an advanced helicopter fitted with high-tech surveillance devices and a Gatling gun used as crowd control during civil disturbances. What could possibly go wrong? While it would be horrific and tragic, if you popped a little bit of synth music in the background, it would be really cool. Blue Thunder. And the moral of this story is, if you're walking on eggs, don't hop. The 80s were a grand decade in some ways, and pretty shitty in some other ways. Before this decade, the most complicated thing in most people's homes would have been the TV remote. But the 80s saw more and more technology creeping into people's lives. VCRs, home computers, and of course high-tech armoured attack helicopters. What? What do you mean you didn't have a high-tech armoured attack helicopter? So what, what, just me then? In John Batham's 1983 film Blue Thunder, Frank Murphy is a helicopter pilot for the LAPD, providing air support for beat cops. He's assigned a new partner as his observer, Lyman Good, but most people just call him Jaffo. Outstanding. The pair come across an abandoned car used in the attempted robbery and accidental killing of a city official, which kicks off the main plot of the film. But first, Murphy and Lyman Good have a new assignment to evaluate a new type of helicopter, Blue Thunder. It's fast, it can run quietly, has all the latest gadgets such as video and audio recording, thermal imaging, night vision, and a computer that can magically tie into government systems that only ask for a password after they've given you the info. The pair uncover a conspiracy which conveniently ties into the accidental death at the beginning of the film. It's a shadowy plot to make Blue Thunder more palatable to dubious city officials by stirring up trouble in some parts of town. I think the boys from Washington have been jerking us around. I think they got bigger plans for this turkey. A shadowy plot uncovered by Murphy and Lyman Good in Blue Thunder, since only Blue Thunder has the tech that could uncover the conspiracy to hype Blue Thunder to local agencies. What? Lyman Good records the conspirators chatting away, incriminating themselves, but is killed, with Murphy turned into a scapegoat. Murphy's on-again, off-again girlfriend has to race across town to deliver a tape of the meeting to a TV reporter with Murphy running interference in the stolen blue thunder. The tape is a state-of-the-art storage device, basically a three-quarter inch umatic tape, which in the 1980s is probably what they used at your school to show you videos like It Came From The Dank, a health education video warning about the dangers of pubic lice. Murphy, who has occasional flashbacks to his days in Nam, runs into an old rival, Cochrane, now Colonel Cochrane, who, surprise surprise, turns out to be part of the conspiracy. Cochrane, being the twat that he is, has an annoying signature catchphrase. Catch you later. Which is guaranteed to make you hate the man more than any of his evil intentions or associations. He dropped a man out of a chopper in Nam and orchestrated the death of Jaffo. I mean, boo, hiss, and all that, but every time he says this, Catch you later. I just want to jam a toothpick into his index finger. Murphy shoots up some police choppers, then manages to best a couple of F-16s before a showdown with Cochrane piloting a more prosaic chopper, but one with really, really big guns. Poor Jaffo has heard all of these stories about Murphy, stories he has to ask Murphy about, which in turn lets us, the audience, in on the man's history. He's either trying to track his sense of timing to see if he's cracking up, or he's infamous for performing a loop-de-loop -loop in a chopper. It's aerodynamically impossible. Anyone who tells you the difference is a damn liar. Apparently that doesn't apply to all chopper designs, in that some can loop-de-loop, -loop, but sustained upside-down flight is not considered a good idea. So yeah, hiring a chopper for an afternoon because you need to quickly cut down some long grass is not advisable. Murphy is almost a bingo card for the 80s action protagonist. Vietnam vet, has a hint of PTSD, people think he's crazy, he gets saddled with a rookie partner, he has a love-hate relationship with his hard-ass boss, lives by himself in very modest surroundings, has an on-again off-again relationship with someone who's quite understanding despite his bullshit. Well, I guess that makes that official. At least one partner is violently killed, uncovers a conspiracy by some authority types working for their own ends, is a loose cannon, and is the only person who can perform something that's thought to be impossible. Come on, and you tell us shit. Bingo! The film's background theme is one of privacy and surveillance. Who doesn't love surveillance and invasion of privacy when it suits us, but hate it when it impacts on us? Blue Thunder also likes to have its cake and eat it when the film shows our heroes perving on a. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna show that on YouTube. 
The film was co-written by Dan O'Bannon, fresh off Alien, with friend Don Jacoby, who apparently wrote the bulk of the film. The original concept was more along the lines of Frank Murphy being a taxi driver style misfit who goes nuts and runs amok through downtown LA in a helicopter gunship. Columbia and director John Badham wanted something a little more fun, so Murphy's psychotic nature was dialed right back and the conspiracy angle added. You can still see leftovers of Crank Frank in the finished film. With thousands of rounds of ammo let loose, the film still manages to keep its body count really low. Blue Thunder itself only causes one actual death, Cochrane. But remember this? Catch you later. Bastard had it coming. John Badham had made films in many genres, but his more notable films included Saturday Night Fever, War Games, Short Circuit, and Stakeout. But Blue Thunder was his big action piece. It's a really well-made film without a lot of the mean-spirited hysteria exhibited by so many 80s action films. The effects are pretty seamless, unnoticeable by most viewers. It's lit quite nicely, important for a film that involves so many nighttime scenes. Roy Scheider was a go-to actor when you wanted someone to convey tough yet vulnerable. He'd already played a few cops in things like The French Connection and Jaws, but managed to make each of them different. But more importantly, Scheider makes his characters likeable, even when they're a maverick like Murphy. 1980s Roy Scheider manages to make you feel like this is a man who's seen some shit in his time. For someone who works the night shift, he's remarkably well tanned, and sometimes you just want to crack the secret of time travel just so you can travel back to when Scheider was a boy and give him a wide-brimmed hat. Hey, Jaffo, how's it what, going? What is this Jaffo shit, though? Look up. What's Jaffo? Look mean? down. Look left. Montoya. Look right. I said, don't worry what about is it. Daniel Stern is perfect as the nerdy noob Lyman Good. He's so likable when he dies, that just plain sucks. I had 20 years in this outfit when your idea of a big time was sitting in front of the TV tube, watching Bugs Bunny, and gnawing on your fudgesicle. Warren Oates, in one of his last roles, had a way of owning his dialogue. He's a quintessential hard-ass 80s cop boss. You bozo, how many regulars come in the front door with a key? Scared the shit out of me. Candy Clark has just the right amount of playful ditziness and fearless strength as Kate. She'll happily jump into a dumpster to retrieve evidence and lead cops on a merry chase. Batham originally wanted Australian actor Brian Brown for the role of Cochrane, but he was unavailable. So as Malcolm McDowell's name was also alliterative, he was hired. Back off, asshole. Oh? What's that I hear? Huh? Threats? Malcolm McDowell who after this movie was the guy you'd hire in your film when you wanted absolutely no doubt as to who the villain is. A Brit in Vietnam? Sure, why not? Malcolm McDowell had a fear of heights, so accepting a role in a film about helicopters may seem like it wasn't the smartest move, but he really liked the role. Catch you later. Of course, the star is the helicopter. For the film, they built two working choppers with custom bodywork. The angular looking craft contrasted nicely with the sleek look of a standard civilian and police chopper of the time. The actual movie version was much heavier than the donor vehicles and about as nimble as the main character in the short-lived series, Parkour Rhino. The film used every trick in the book to make the chopper work, filming the cast in a static chopper set on top of a building, a little process work here and there, models and radio controlled choppers. You're a nice guy, nice things happen to you. I'll try to remember that. Blue Thunder was a modest success at the box office, but took around half as much money as Badham's other 1983 film, War Games. But like so many middling successes, it's been a perennial favourite on television and was quite a successful home video rental. Of course, the TV version has a few language substitutions that in no way ruin the film's most quotable dialogue. Uh, oh yeah, oh I forgot to tell you, I found out what Jaffo is. Just another fornicating observer, huh? Blue Thunder also provided the inspiration for a Sega video game, Thunderblade, which even used a digitized still from the movie. Blue Thunder didn't kickstart a wave of movies about high-tech vehicles, but television was already on the case. Knight Rider about a high-tech supercar had already premiered the year before Blue Thunder's release, but the success of that show and this movie led to more super vehicles in shows like Street Hawk, Auto Man, another helicopter-based series, Airwolf, and while you're at it, a short-lived Blue Thunder TV series in 1984. You can run, but you can't hide. Joe Lewis, that's very good. That's what I mean. Blue Thunder was a film that's so very, very 80s, but mostly in a good way. It's got a good script and direction, nice action, and a great cast. It's definitely one for the 80s throwback movie and pizza night. Catch you later. 
If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. You know, he checks his sanity with his wristwatch. What do you check yours with, a dipstick?